This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Please stay tuned for special offers. Now, when you were starting out as a writer, you were black, impoverished, homosexual. You must have said to yourself, gee, how disadvantaged can I get? Well, no, I thought I hit the jackpot. Oh, great. <laughs> the American writer James Baldwin was born 100 years ago this month. He was, by any stretch of the imagination, one of the most radical and important voices of the 20th century. His 1956 novel, Giovanni's Room, was a remarkable achievement. It was the first mainstream novel written by a black man to include queer themes. Made even more remarkable by the fact that it would be another seven years before segregation was ended in America, and decades before the birth of gay rights in the country. He was the outspoken grandson of a slave who bore witness to the consequences of American racial strife. I was born at a certain time, in a certain skin, in a certain place. And you pay for it. Everybody pays for that. He was an opinionated, critical, blunt and provocative man at a time when that was considered dangerous. But it was as an author that he took the greatest risks that no other commercial writer at the time was taking that could so easily have destroyed his career. His first novel, the semi-autobiographical Go Tell It on the Mountain, was published in America in 1952, and it was an immediate critical and commercial success. His follow-up novel would come four years later. When his American publisher, Alfred Knopf, received the manuscript for Giovanni's Room, he told Baldwin that he should burn it, convinced that it would alienate the newly won audience acquired by his previous bestseller. Undeterred, Baldwin decided to ignore his publisher's advice and approach a British publisher instead. Within a decade, he would become America's most famous writer. There ain't I can do, I'm nothing I can say. Love has never been a popular movement. The world is held together, really it is held together, by the love and the passion of very few people. James Arthur Jones was born on the 2nd of August, 1924, on the island of Manhattan, in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance. An outpouring of creativity in the arts associated with the Great Migration, the largest internal migration in history. Between 1910 and 1970, millions of black Americans fled the southern United States for the northern and western cities. Emma Burgess Jones, Baldwin's mother, a young Maryland crab picker and oyster shucker, moved to Harlem at the age of 19. Her first son, James, was born out of wedlock, and Emma raised him as a single mother. Little is known about Baldwin's biological father, but when he was three years old, Emma married David Baldwin, a great migrant charismatic preacher. The preacher, who despised his adopted son, would be the basis of the austere preacher in Go Tell It on the Mountain. Growing up in poverty and violence, the eldest of nine children, the young James found refuge in reading books at the public library. It was books that taught me, were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive and he began writing poems, short stories, and plays at a very young age. There were two libraries in Harlem, and by the time I was 13, I had read every book in both libraries and had a card downtown for 42nd Street. What I had to do then was bring the two things together, the possibilities the book suggested and the impossibilities of the life around me. Baldwin himself became a charismatic preacher at the age of 14 and his brief experience in the church would have an important impact on his rhetorical style and on the themes, symbols, and biblical allusions in his writing. Whether one civilization has the right to overtake and subjugate and in fact to destroy another. When you are standing in the pulpit, you must sound as though you know what you're talking about. When you're writing, you're trying to find out something which you don't know. Biblical analogies abound in his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and at the beginning of Giovanni's Room, a character turns to the main protagonist, David, and comments that, Nobody can stay in the Garden of Eden. To which David replies prophetically, 
People have scarcely seen their garden before they see the flaming sword. The Old Testament tale of David and Jonathan is often considered an early biblical example of same-sex love, and Baldwin, a voracious reader and lapsed Christian, knew the passage well. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Baldwin was referencing the biblical coupling in Giovanni's room. The two main characters in the novel are David and Giovanni, the Italian form of John. Baldwin used the name David often. It was the name of his stepfather, his brother, his character from his short story The Outing, the preacher's son in his play Amen Corner, and of course, the main protagonist in Giovanni's Room. Post-World War II, riots erupted in two dozen cities and racist violence killed or injured hundreds of people. Baldwin, tired of the violence, the death of his friends and the everyday racism he faced, began making plans to leave the US. I knew what was going to happen to me. I'd kill or be killed. I left because I didn't think I could survive the race problems. Paris in 1948 meant freedom for many American expats like Baldwin, who abandoned the United States that year for the French capital. He became part of the fabled African-American expatriates, who came to Paris to pursue a freer life away from the repressive Jim Crow laws. People like Richard Wright, Josephine Baker, Beaufort Delaney and Langston Hughes. Baldwin later said that he could not have finished his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, in America. And he almost certainly could not have written his second novel there. He needed to move away. At a safe distance from the country of his birth, he, like others, felt better disposed to write about it. Baldwin arrived in France on the 11th of November, 1948, with $40 in his pocket. He would stay in Paris for the next eight years, and he would spend most of his adult life in France as an exile. Mist clung to the river, softening that army of trees, softening those stones, hiding the city's dreadful corkscrew alleys and dead-end streets. On arrival, he was taken to Les Deux Magots, a café and popular artist hub in Saint-Germain-de-Prés, where on any given day, Simone de Beauvoir, Truman Capote or Jean-Paul Sartre might be sat at a busy table. The city was already familiar to him because he had studied Honoré de Balzac and Gustave Flaubert. Behind the counter sat one of those absolutely inimitable and indomitable ladies produced only in the city of Paris, but produced there in great numbers. All over Paris, they sit behind their counters like a mother bird in a nest and brood over the cash register like an egg. He had already absorbed Paris from the pages of books, and now he was here, and he decided that a novel set in the City of Lights was his destiny. It was a stark contrast from America. In Paris, there were no signs outside hotels saying no coloreds, and Baldwin could rent a cheap room wherever he wanted. Nobody cared if a black man took a white woman back to a hotel room, or even if two men were known to be sleeping together there. In Paris, Baldwin was free. He could live openly as a gay black man at a time when in the US there was such deep social hatred of those who shared either Baldwin's race or sexual identity, let alone both. Paris gave Baldwin the opportunity not afforded elsewhere to openly explore both his literary craft and his sexuality. Giovanni's Room tells the story of an American expat who has a contentious love affair with a bartender he meets at a Parisian bar. And it was in Paris that Baldwin encountered the characters, situations and settings that would inhabit Giovanni's Room. In his book, every small town, every seedy bar, taxi drive and Paris street all ring with biting authenticity. Giovanni, an Italian farm boy who plays violin and has moved to Paris, lives in a room that seems almost as if the garbage of Paris were dumped in it. A room that contains the residue of Giovanni's life. Like Balzac, Baldwin found in Paris not only a place to work, but also a literary subject. I'm sure that my life in France would have been very different had I not met Balzac. Even though I hadn't experienced it yet, I understood something about the concierge, all the French institutions and personalities, the way that country and its society works, 
how to find my way around in it, not get lost in it, and not feel rejected by it. Balzac's The Human Comedy is a vast series of novels and stories where he tirelessly observed and detailed the lives and social mores of the bourgeoisie and the working classes of France. Lives that have been ignored in literature because they were ugly or vulgar. Balzac's influence is apparent in the intense realism of Baldwin's book, the style and the radical subject matter. It is even possible that Balzac was in the back of Baldwin's mind when he described where Giovanni lived. The street he lived on was wide, respectable rather than elegant, and massive with fairly recent apartment buildings. His room was in the back, on the ground floor of the last building on the street. Baldwin was also influenced by Henry James, another American writer who lived a self-imposed exile and came to Europe to find out what it means to be an American. Through all his years in Paris, Baldwin would hang a signed picture of Henry James over his writing desk. And like David in Giovanni's Room, which has been called Baldwin's most Jamesian novel, the protagonist in James's novel The Ambassadors, Louis Lambert Strether, is an American expatriate who came to Paris to try to find out what he wants to do with his life. Giovanni's Room is about what happens to you if you don't tell the truth to yourself. It's about the failure of innocence. The Ambassadors is about Strether's struggle with that problem. As the academic Lyle H. Powers wrote, Both Baldwin and James examine the problem of learning to live in a civilized society whose manners, conventions and prejudices often threaten individual integrity of coming to terms with that society's demands and of managing to make the necessary compromises, but without giving up one's essential self. Giovanni's Room is set in the contemporary Paris of American expatriates and a rented house in the south of France, where a young white American man, David, the blonde, handsome narrator of the book, heads to Paris to sort himself out prior to his marriage to his fiancée, Hella and finds himself caught between desire and conventional morality. The book is told in flashbacks and darts between David's real-time angst and his recent past. In David's present, he is in the middle of a severe alcoholic episode. The house he is readying to leave is in a small village where the locals notice everything. I can make no answer to her last sardonic thrust. Having forgotten that in a small village, almost every move is made under the village's collective eye and ear. During the flashback, a relationship develops between David and Giovanni, an Italian barman in the grim and seedy gay dives of nocturnal Paris, that he frequents with Jacques, a friend he does not really like, but who is supporting him financially. This is not David's first same-sex encounter, as early on we learn of his relationship with his best friend Joey, an encounter that made him doubt his masculinity and filled him with anxiety and shame. Later in the army, he has another sexual encounter with a fellow soldier and once again struggles with his sexuality. That body suddenly seemed the black opening of a cavern in which I would be tortured till madness came in which I would lose my manhood. It is David's fear of deviating from society's norms that hangs over and ultimately drives the characters in the book. The bar Giovanni works in is owned by Guillaume, an older gay man from a well-respected French family, whose grisly fate at Giovanni's hands will make him a key player in the tragic spirit in which the book commences and concludes. Dingy bars like Guillaume's are inhabited by customers that disgust David and act as a mirror for his own self-loathing. His description of a drag queen is particularly venomous. It looked like a mummy or a zombie. This was the first overwhelming impression or something walking after it had been put to death and it walked really like someone who might be sleepwalking or like those figures in slow motion one sometimes sees on the screen. Despite how David feels about himself and the places he gets drunk in Paris, he allows Giovanni to fall for him and the two men begin an affair that mostly takes place in the titular room, a squalid hovel that Giovanni rents. 
Hella, David's fiance, is away traveling when he and Giovanni meet for the first time, and the relationship between the two men develops during her absence and concludes unceremoniously upon her return. When David decides to marry her and conform to society's norms and expectations, Giovanni is cruelly denied any explanation for being unceremoniously dumped, leading to an awkward chance encounter between David, Hella, and Giovanni. David had told his fiancée that Giovanni was just his roommate, and she cannot figure out why Giovanni is so angry when they meet. She and David decide to go to the south of France, but once again he is unable to suppress his same-sex desire, and once again heads out to a gay bar, where he meets a sailor. While at the bar with the man, David is surprised to find a heartbroken Hella standing behind him an episode that reveals the depth of cruelty that an inability to love oneself can lead to. As she packs her bags to head home alone to America, Hella turns to David and says, Americans should never come to Europe. It means they can never be happy again. What's the good of an American who isn't happy? Happiness was all we had. But everybody pays for that. Do you think you could describe yourself as a revolutionary writer? I don't know what I am. I'm a writer in a revolutionary situation. Should a publisher exercise his own taste in the selection of books? I think so. The publisher who suggested the manuscript of Giovanni's Room should be burnt because of the overtly homosexual content offended Baldwin deeply and missed the point. As far as Baldwin was concerned, the sexuality of the subjects was incidental to the broader themes. This was not an all-white homosexual novel, but an essay on the human consequences of the problematic American condition, disguised as fiction. With this book, Baldwin wanted to prove that he was not merely a Negro writer, and he would not let his talent be defined solely by racial subjects. Giovanni's Room is a novel that refuses to accept the usual boundaries of nationality, ethnicity, gender, or sexuality. A novel that shows no matter who we are, if we embrace fear, shame, and prejudice, we fail, and no place, America, France, or anywhere else, will be our refuge. Baldwin's leading concern throughout his writing career was the effect that the American experiment has on its people. He believed that the United States was a spiritual disaster for those homeless Europeans who now call themselves Americans and who have never been able to resolve their relationship either to the continent they fled or to the continent they conquered. For Baldwin, the character of David in Giovanni's room was one of those homeless Europeans. From my point of view, no label, no slogan, no party and no... Um, skin color, and indeed no religion, is more important than the human being. I'd like to talk about Skillshare, the largest online learning community for creatives, with thousands of classes led by industry experts across film, illustration, design, freelance, and more. It is an excellent way to take your career, skills, hobbies, or passions to the next level. The great thing is that these classes are designed by creatives for creatives. These are industry experts who are sharing their skills. It's not just about creativity, it's about how you make it work for you. My favourite thing is I can do classes in between projects and at my own pace. I'm on my second lesson with them and now I'm learning new editing skills. It has been so useful to me and I'm picking up new ideas which will help my channel. The first 500 people to use my link skl.sh forward slash great books explained 08241 which is also in the description below will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. So why not get started today?